Well, tonight is no dog and pig show, but it is, <laughs> ooh, it's a tough word as well. I chose to give the message, the title, The Enemy Among Us. Where might they be? Who might they be? Jesus is describing for his disciples this countercultural life. One of my favorite commentaries is using that phrase over and over to describe the concept that Jesus is teaching in this Sermon on the Mount countercultural. Uh, it smacks, that's, that term smacks to me of hippies. It, I can't help myself. I mean, there was a yogurt shop in Shreveport back in the day, back when I was pastoring at Haynes Avenue, which would have been from 1983 to 1987. That was before there was a yogurt shop on every corner. And it was called counterculture, frozen yogurt. I wouldn't stop there because I knew that it was going to be full, filled with weirdos and oddballs. And there were enough of those that just showed up without me having to go and seek them out. So I, I avoided the counterculture yogurt shop because, again, it smacked to me of hippies, smelly folks with long hair. Some of you are former hippies, and I apologize for that characterization, but it probably is not far away from being, being accurate. So when this commentary author said that Jesus was countercultural for his generation, I had to back up a little bit and be a little bit more inclusive of my understanding of that phrase, countercultural. It was countercultural in that it went against the flow. It flew in the face of commonly held wisdom, practice, patterns, morals, and values. And yet he, he was unrelenting. He kept again and again with this pattern. You've heard that it was said. The ancients told you. You've heard it said of old, and then he would give a passage of Scripture and continue, but I say unto you. Last Sunday night, we spent a few minutes with that idea of if somebody smacks you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. I thought that was a tough concept, but I'm going to tell you that was easier than tonight. It's easier to let somebody be mean to you and turn the other cheek and go on your way. I mean, that, that's doable. That's within the realm of reality. This one tonight, it's going to take a little bit more than we can conjure up. It's going to take a little bit more goody than we can, can put together ourselves, even encouraging one another. Jesus took it a step further. And Laura, I'm going to go through verse 48. I, I gave Kelly the wrong number, so I'm not going to stop at 46. I'm going to continue through 47 and 48. I don't know if that messes you up or not. Beginning in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5, here's the, the formula. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, most of us are reading English Bibles. There may be one or two of you that have a Greek New Testament in front of you. But in the English Bible, most of us, when there's an Old Testament quotation, in my Bible in particular, it, it puts it in small caps. It differentiates it from the, the regular New Testament and, and lets me know when they are alluding to a passage of Scripture that was extracted directly from the Old Testament. In that passage, when it says, and, and it does the same thing on the, the version that we're using with the screens on that New American Standard Version, notice the difference. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Do you notice how that is capitalized? You notice what happens with the next part of that passage? It reverts to lowercase. You've heard that it was said, past tense, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
if you are going to be a follower of Christ, you need to look like this. If you're going to make a difference in your community, in that circle of influence that you have, you need to be like this. Oh, it's not going to be easy. And it's going to go against your basic human nature. In fact, it's going to, to defy all of your base instincts. You're going to be prompted in your instinctive response to do something else. Jesus said, but I say to you. Okay, let's, let's break it down. Ask three simple questions. One, who is my enemy? Jesus held up this perver perversion of God's original command. The original command was clear. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. And indeed, that was what they had been taught. But then he realized that added to that, in addition to that primary idea, was a secondary thought, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, Jesus was, was queried on one occasion by a very, very intelligent fellow who probably was trying to trap Jesus more than he was seeking information. And, and he asked him, what's the great commandment? Out, out of all of them, which one would you classify as the number one on the hit parade? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the first part of the Ten Commandments are a summary of that. They describe the person who loves God with everything that they have. This is the great and foremost commandment, love God first. But he said the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Nowhere in, in that original Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, nowhere in its, its breaking out of of order for the day, of laws that were to guide the community, that were to shape their thinking about one another and about their God. Nowhere was there to be found this command to hate one's enemy. So where did it come from? It, it was a conclusion that they reached themselves along the way. Yeah, we can love our neighbors, and they could, they could define who that was. Now we know that they didn't get that right all the time because Jesus tells a parable, and we're going to get to that a little later, tells a parable when the question is asked, well, who is my neighbor? If I am to love my neighbor as myself, who, who is that? How far does that expand? But nowhere is there to be found this, this statement that says, love this group and hate this group. In fact, within the, the Deuteronomic Code, within the outworking of the law that God gave and that we know as the Ten Commandments, there, there were some explanations that make us think contrary to that idea of hating your enemy. For instance, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, whose who's ox or donkey? Your enemy. Okay, not, not your friends, not your neighbors. This, you know, for me, this would be like if you, if you meet your enemy's dog wandering off. What are you to do about that? Okay, here's the law. Here's the rule. If you see your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall re surely release it with him. Now, does that sound like a, a way to express hating your enemy? No. No. I mean, two situations there, ox, donkey, wandering off. If you hate the guy, you say, good riddance. And you say, shoo, get away from here, hoping that your enemy is going to suffer greatly because their favorite ox or their favorite donkey is now no longer unavailable. If you come along and this person who hates your guts, and you know it, they have said things that are hurtful and cruel to you, and, and you come along and they have overloaded their mule. Their donkey has collapsed under the weight of its load. What do you do if it's your enemy? You laugh. You poke fun. Didn't you read the load restrictions on that back leg of that donkey? It's clearly printed, printed right there. You overloaded your mule. You shouldn't have done that. No, he said you need to stop and help him unload that and get his, get his donkey up so that he can go on his way. That does not sound like a prescription for hating your enemy. Where did it come from? That, that nation certainly was a hated nation along the way. We, we know that. The Jews were a hated people, and so often there was conflict between not, not just 
ideologies, but conflict between their faith and the faith of the other nations who were around them. There was great wickedness that they were exposed to as they came in, even to Canaan, the promised land. And there was conflict as a result of that wickedness. And God gave instructions about how they were to take the land. And it involved conflict with other nations. But even then, God's instruction for them on a personal level was not to hate your enemy. They were following God's judicial instructions for taking the land. They were not, they were not instructed to, to circle the wagon. Just love those who are like you and who love you and hate everybody else who's different in one way or another. The wisdom writer in Proverbs chapter 25 took it a step further and said, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Who is my enemy? I started making a list, and I quit because it was getting too long. Who is my enemy? My enemy, your enemy, is, is someone, and this is a general statement, but someone that we have purposefully chosen to hate. Someone that we have made the conscious choice to put on the other side of the line, on the other side of the fence, for whatever reason. And, and you may have a good reason, you may not have a good reason, but you can purposefully choose to alienate yourself from that person, to choose the other side, and they become your stated enemy by your choice, by your doing. Who is my enemy? Well, oftentimes it's someone who is different from me. It could be somebody who's physically different, somebody who is a, a different race, someone who speaks a different language, someone who is culturally distinct from me. Maybe they're different socially because they, well, they just think they're better than me. Or they live in a different fashion than I do, and I just can't understand, and I don't want to understand, and I, don't, I just don't like them. Somebody who is spiritually different from me, somebody who is politically different from me. These are polarizing times. For some of you, if you are a member of a given party, you can't imagine being a friend with somebody of the other party. If you are pro-life, then that must need to mean that everybody who's pro-choice has to be your enemy. We line up along those ideological fault lines, choosing our enemy. Who's my enemy? Sometimes it's that person who has what I want and I, I can't have it or I can't get it. Who's my enemy? Someone who has hurt me, who said a hurtful thing, who did a hurtful thing, and as a result of that hurt, I have chosen to make them my enemy, my stated enemy. Who is my enemy? Well, it could be someone I have been taught to hate. Hate can be generational. Enemies can be generational. You grew up in a household, you grew up in a neighborhood, you grew up in a church where certain people were labeled. They were tagged. We don't associate with them. We don't approve of them. In fact, we dislike them. Well, let me take it a step further. We hate them. Don't you dare bring one of them home with you. Don't you dare bring one of them to church. Don't you dare be caught associating with one of them because there will be severe repercussions in your circle, in your group. We don't understand it. Little fellows don't understand it at first. They're, they don't come with those preconceived notions about people. They are taught to be bigoted. They're taught to be hate-filled. Oh, they learn their lessons well. And early on can regurgitate some of the things that they've heard around the table or in the context of their home. That's my enemy. The hard thing is that, that we have to bring that that thought process to church. We, we bring it to our churches. We bring it to worship. And, and somehow or another, we're expecting God to, to baptize it, to sanctify it, and make it okay. Because generally, I'm a good person. I treat people nice, the ones that I like. I am an honorable person most of the time. I, I get along with most people in my community. 
So I'm good, God. And, and I, I hope that you're satisfied with that level of competency in my faith and you'll overlook my shortcomings. And we do. We overlook those shortcomings because we often share those feelings and we might even congregate around that hate and even our enemies. So Jesus looked at that group of people who were prospects, followers, seekers, and said to them, I know that's what you've heard. That's what you've been told. That's how you've grown up, to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I want to take you down a different path. Not just a slight deviation. I want you to take a hard turn away from that. And, and I want us to go in a different direction. So the second question that, that is posed here is, what, what is my responsibility to that person who I have identified as my enemy for whatever reason? But I say to you, love your enemies. And then go a step further. Pray for those who persecute you. So that, here's the consequence, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And because here's his record, he is that God who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Back to what we talked a little bit on last Sunday night about it is, it is that idea of the common grace of God's being gracious to many who've never bowed a knee to him, who've never believed in him, but because they are a part of the community, because they are a part of the world, they involuntarily receive part of the blessing of God. The sun shines, the rain falls, just because that's who God is. And he said, that's, that's who God is, and because that's who he is, now I, I want you to be like that. In these verses beginning in verse 44 and going down through verse 47, there are two answers to the question, well, why? Why should we love our enemy? Why should we go to the trouble? Why should we, we aggravate ourselves with this effort to to placate our enemy for two reasons. Number one, makes us more like God. We look like God when, when we go outside what is normal, what is expected. Oh, those are your friends. Oh, how can you tell by the way you treat them? I mean, when they come around, you light up. When you're with them, you laugh, you carry on. But when they show up, you become stern, stoic, uncomfortable. It's obvious. So he challenges us to be more like our Father, who is even-handed, but it's so much more than that, is gracious and extends grace. That's one reason. But secondly, Loving our enemy not only makes us more like God, but it also differentiates us from the world. And, and beginning in verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Well, of course they do. I mean, they're going to hang out with people that they like. When they gather up, usually it's a bunch of other tax collectors and a few people who like them. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? He's pretty pointed there. Even, even folks who are outside of faith can do that. That's not a hard thing. When you love people who are nice to you, uh, when you surround yourself with those who have been kind to you, we make ourselves different from the world when we are able to love our enemies. In his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it like this, the Christian is a man who is above and goes beyond the natural man at his very best and highest. We're not just trying to keep up with the status quo, but we are to go above and to go beyond. There are many people in the world who are not Christian, but who are very moral and highly ethical men whose word is their bond and who are scrupulous and honest, just and upright. You never find them doing a shady thing to anybody, but they're not Christian and they will tell you so. They do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and may have rejected the whole of the New Testament teaching with scorn, but they are absolutely straightforward, honest, and true. Now, the Christian, by definition here, is a man who is capable of doing something that the best natural man cannot do. He goes beyond and does more than that. He exceeds. He is separate from all others, and not only from the worst among others, but from the very best and highest among them. We get this criticism sometimes. 
from folks who don't like church. Some of my very favorite conversations. Preacher, you know why I don't come to church? No, nah, but I'm thinking you're probably about to tell me. I am. I don't need to come to your church. Because I know a lot of people who never darken the doors of the church. Who are more moral. Who are better. Who are kinder. Who are more honest than a lot of the people in your church. And they're looking for an argument. And I say, I know. You're right. Man, what, a, what an indictment. I mean, all, all they're expecting, because they don't know any better. They don't know the Lord. But all they're expecting is that we rise to the level of the highest standards of the unsaved. Be moral, be upright, be honest, be straightforward, keep your word, all those things. And, and then maybe they would consider us. No, no, because anybody can do that. Anybody who wants to hit it a lick and a miss can, can rise to that level if they so desire. Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you just to keep up with the Joneses. I, I would love for you to go beyond that, to exceed that. And to do that, you're going to need to love your enemy. Unfortunately, this passage is reserved mostly for weddings. Some are for funerals, some are for weddings. And, and this one is for weddings. But as Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he described, for me, this is, this is like him taking words and drawing a picture of Christ and a picture of who we are to be in Christ, and who we can be in Christ. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It doesn't brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It isn't provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered. I like that part. Basically it means we don't keep score. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We can say instinctively, Clint, I can't. I, I can't, I just can't love them. You don't know what they've done. You don't know where I've been with them. And I would have to say somewhat flippantly and pastorally, I don't care. There's no qualification here. Jesus says, love your enemies as long as. Love your enemies if they have. He just says, love your enemies and pray for them. Pray for them. Have, here's, here's a neat little maxim. If you haven't figured this one out, I want you to figure this one out. Do you know that you cannot pray for somebody and hate them at the same time? You, you can't do it. It doesn't work. Uh, some of you, uh, you need to learn this because it would help you in some of your marital situations. You cannot pray for somebody and hate them at the same time because once you start praying for somebody, the hate begins to dissipate. The only way you can maintain your dislike and your hate is to stop praying. So when Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who curse you, they pray for those who have come against you, he's giving you a little hint there. You start praying for them, and, and, and your prayers are not going to be, please let me be clear about this, your prayer is not going to be, please, Lord, I, I want this person whose guts I've hated for so long, I want them to become my best friend. No, I don't. I want them to become my best buddy. I want to hang out with them. I want to go to lunch with them. I, I want to, to share my hobby with them. No, not, not really. Not really. I mean, that's, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for this thing to be so silly that, that I want to turn my enemy into my best bud. That, that's not the prayer. What is my responsibility to my enemy? To love them and to pray for them. So let's wind it up. What are the limits of that love? What are the, the limits of, of that expression of love toward my enemy? When we get to verse 48, Jesus concluded with this, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's, let's not, again, be silly here. We'll never get it completely right. We're never going to be like God completely. Uh, we are a long way from that. God is an infinite God who has grace and mercy and love, and He's demonstrated that perfectly in His Son, Jesus Christ, and we're a long way from that. We are finite beings. But with that acknowledged, and the Lord knew that, 
He challenges us, you strive toward this goal of maturity. You strive toward this goal of looking like me, of being like I am, as you deal with your enemies. So our goal here is to imitate our Heavenly Father with this, this kind of love. Here, here are the limits of our love. One, you've got to be willing to give. You, you've got to be willing to be the one to stop and help the man with the overloaded donkey. You literalist in the room are saying, hadn't seen that one in a while. You know what I'm talking about. Every single day, there are people in your world, some that you like and some that you don't like, and you come across them and their donkeys are overloaded. They have squatted down in the road and they can't take a step and they need somebody who can help them. Their ox and their donkey wander away. And you can shoo it, you can curse it, pray that it never comes back, or you can help them round it up and give it back to them and let them watch you with eyes and mouths open wondering why did you do that? They know. They know. You are their enemy. They are your enemy. And so why, why would you do that? Don't be all pious and sanctimonious about it. Just do it. Just do it because when you, when you care about somebody, when you're willing to love them, then you're going to be willing to get involved. You're going to be willing to give yourself away. You're not going to avoid them like the plague. Number two, you're going to be willing to make sacrifices. You don't help them with the goal that, well, one day you can return the favor. And don't even say that. Well, I'm helping you. One day when I need help, you can help me. No, 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 no. No strings attached. You're not trying to create this quid pro quo relationship here where I'm going to help you and one day you can help me. I mean, that's, that's what the politicians do. You talk, you've heard about politics making strange bedfellows. That's why you make deals with people who you're diametrically opposed to in your philosophy because you're hoping that one day I'm going to be able to call in the favor and you're going to help me. No, just do the right thing because love is self-giving and it's willing to sacrifice without expecting anything in return. And oh, by the way, it also desires the very best for its object. For my enemy. I can be very disturbed about their lifestyle. I can be very disturbed about what they may have done to somebody I love or even to me. And I, I may yearn for justice. I may yearn, you know, for, for God to make it right at some point in the future. But as far as it depends on me in this moment, as far as I'm concerned, self-giving, self-sacrificing love that desires the very best for its object. What would that be? Wouldn't it be that Somewhere along the way, that person come to know Christ like you know Christ? Wouldn't it be that, that somewhere along the way, that person actually understand that, that your life is different because you know Christ? And so we can begin to look at them a bit differently. Maybe with a little compassion, uh, certainly with a little humility, not quite as arrogantly as we have in the past when we thought we were all right and they were all wrong, uh, looking at them with concern, wanting Man, praying that something would happen to change their heart and change their mind. You've heard it said by the old folks, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But we see when we hear the Lord's instruction, when we will love our enemies with this love and purposefully pray for them, we're going to be changed. Something's going to happen to us. Our enemies may remain the same. In fact, there's a good chance that they do. By the way, y'all, we can't expect lost people to play by our Christian rules. You understand that? Lost people don't know how to behave but one way. They, they know how to behave like lost people. So it isn't that you're thinking, well, I'm going to pray for them and they're going to come around in my way of thinking. Not necessarily. They may still be your lost enemy at the end of this, but you're going to change. And you know what? Sometimes when you change, they are changed. 